Today on Beers TV, it's ULM lighting and then giving away some of our favorite lighting at the end. I'm Ryan, your host of Beers TV's Tank Trials ULM edition. Tank Trials is all about taking everything the BRS team and the reefing community knows about a very specific approach to reefing. Implementing that knowledge, tracking the progress, and exploring the results. This is episode 10 of the ULM series and development of an ultra low maintenance system. The goal is a stable show caliber tank which requires as little maintenance as possible, potentially only performing a few minutes of maintenance a month. It's been a few weeks since our last ULM update while I was on vacation, so thanks for hanging in there. And at the end of today's video, I'll throw in a few updates of what's happened since I was gone. Today is all about ULM lighting, and we're going to select and set up options for all three tanks. Lighting's one of the three major components of reef tank biology. If we get lighting, filtration, and chemistry right for the corals that we're attempting to maintain, we're going to produce a stunning, long-lasting reef tank. So I would call today's lighting episode one of the more critical topics for the ULM series. For this series, we're of course going to attempt to find the lowest maintenance solutions available. When you think lighting, high maintenance really doesn't come to mind. I mean, you should be able to plug them in, set up a timer or a few sliders, and then walk away. But there's often more to it than that, with many reefers not achieving the desired results and a lot of undesirable tasks associated with that. In that spirit, I think it makes sense to start by sharing what I think makes lighting high maintenance, follow up with some of the options, and then share our installation and our set it and forget it settings. Number one, no matter what light or technology you select, it should be a set it and forget it solution. Other than cleaning the lens or fans occasionally, you should not have to touch or even think about the lights or settings. In fact, every time you do touch the lights, you should probably anticipate immediate setbacks rather than gains. Gains are more often associated with long-term stability, minimal changes, and allowing the corals to adapt to the light. Selecting the wrong light for your tank desires, installing it wrong, or using the wrong settings is what causes you to have to make constant adjustments and not only makes the light high maintenance, but also stresses out the corals with chronic slow growth, poor coloration, or even mortality. Second, it should be easy to get the light out of the way during actual tank maintenance. If the light makes it difficult for you to reach into the tank to perform general maintenance, I think it's fair to say the light is creating unnecessary maintenance complications for a tank designed specifically to be ULM. Third, our lighting selection should last a long time because replacing it or constantly repairing it is certainly one of the highest maintenance components and not something that anyone wants to do. Let's start with number one in the ULM requirement that it should be a set it and forget it solution. We've mentioned in many BRS TV episodes that halides and T5s are largely that solution. With both of these options, you can select the right option, mount it, plug it into a timer, and you're done. Lighting will never be the reason that you don't achieve proper biology or a successful reef tank. So why is that the case? I'd say there are four primary reasons. The biggest is there's clearly identified time-tested bulb, fixture, and reflector options that have produced long-term results for a critical mass of reefers. Meaning if you select one of the options that others have used for tanks like yours, you just really don't need advanced knowledge about PAR, spectrum, or setup. Getting the correct PAR is mainly just a function of bulb choice and quantity for the type of tank you want to maintain. Researching the exact PAR goals for your corals and measuring it just isn't a real requirement when you're emulating other successful options. Just plug it into the wall. Same could be said of Spectrum. Almost everyone uses proven bulbs like the Radium Halides or ATI Blue Plus, which have Spectrum mixes, which everyone will agree produces results. And then some supportive bulbs to bring out desirable color and aesthetic appeal, with these popular bulb choices, just plug the light in and spectrum is not a concern. Generally speaking, you also don't have to be overly concerned about distribution of that light either. The T5's halides and their optimized reflectors produce an obvious ultra-wide blanket of light which evenly illuminates a tank and prevents shadowing or shading in the tank. That said, I think the most direct reason halides and T5s produce set it and forget it results is a simple fixed design of these lights actually prevents you from messing with the PAR intensity and spectrum mix constantly. They're dimmable options, but even then, most people will program halides and T5s, plug them in with a proper on-off cycle, and then leave them alone. A lot of us think this is the very heart of why older types of lighting technology are so successful and ultimately so low maintenance. It isn't necessarily that you're going to hit the perfect spectrum or PAR level when you install a T5 or halide solution. In fact, you're almost certainly not. However, within reason, corals are amazingly adaptive animals, meaning if you plug it in, 
even not perfect light, but they give them a chance to adapt to the lighting selection, they probably will. Successful lighting as a component of biology is less about it being the perfect source of light and much more about it being a stable, consistent source of light energy for the coral zooxanthellae. As long as it's stable and consistent, the coral zooxanthellae can adapt to a wide array of lighting to produce energy for the corals through photosynthesis. If there's one takeaway from today, stability is the number one concern and the most critical consideration. In fact, it might be wise to update the biology triangle to say stable chemistry, stable filtration, and stable lighting. This is particularly true if you progress on to harder to keep corals. Okay, looking at LED options in terms of set it and forget it, LEDs can absolutely be just as easy to set up as a set and forget it option. However, that's very often not the case and LED options end up being pretty high maintenance with frequent ongoing adjustments. I think that's partially because there's so many brands, designs, ways to install them, setup options, and the landscape is constantly changing. It's just more difficult to find the nexus point where a critical mass of reefers have found success and then emulate it. There's also many more considerations with LEDs in terms of placement, PAR intensity, PAR spectrum mixes, and dimming options. Sadly, there's also very little direction from a majority of the manufacturers of these lights on how to properly install them and set the lights up to achieve legit set it and forget it results with their product. What does 50% intensity equate to in PAR and at what mounting height? And a 75% setting could just as easy be 150 PARs, 300, or even 450 depending on the light. More importantly, what is the goal PAR for the corals you want to keep? And so very few of us own a tool like a PAR meter to even be able to measure it. Pretty much the same thing with spectrum. Most of the LED options out there allow for full control over every spectrum channel with very limited guidance on how to use them or what a healthy spectrum for corals even looks like. In addition to that, basically no one owns a tool to measure spectrum and see what the resulting spectrum mix looks like. Net result, there's a lot of us reefers out there just winging it and adjusting to what looks good to the eye, which has absolutely zero to do with the biology of the coral. We just shouldn't be surprised if that doesn't produce set it and forget it results. All that said, I think there's enough information out there that most of us can use the available information to properly set up an LED light on our reef tanks. The most common issue, preventing set up and forget it results, is actually associated with why most of us buy LEDs in the first place. LEDs are just cooler than older technologies. They have cool phone apps, all kinds of advanced options, sliders, dimmers, sunrise, and set effects. They're low profile and compact. All of these things are just begging us to play with them like it's a toy or turbocharger rather than a stable source of nutrition for our corals and their zooxanthellae. Sometimes adjustments to the light to get the corals to look a certain way, sometimes increasing par with the misdirected belief that more is always better, very often adjustments to mounting heights and the number of modules because the low profile visually attractive module ends up being more similar to a spotlight than a large diffuse source of light which is hard to shadow. Not surprisingly, all these frequent changes very often doesn't result in the desired coral health results, which if you didn't know any better, begs us to make even more adjustments, which more times than not only stresses out the corals and zooxanthellae even more. They often look worse, so reefers make more adjustments and so on. This is what I would call not only not a successful path, but also a very high maintenance path. So obviously setting up and using LED aquarium lights isn't as impossible as I just made it sound or no one would be successful using them. And that's certainly not the case. But it should be apparent how different it is than a plug and play simplicity of older technology like T5s and halides. With that in mind, one of the ways that we've been trying to make this all a bit easier is fill in some of that missing information with the BRS TV Investigates episodes where we measure basically every aspect of a light performance in a wide variety of environments and then share it. Then supportive of that, Randy's been recently producing some spotlights where he uses that data to provide distinct installation suggestions for various installs and goals. Direct install and setup instructions from those spotlights Randy's doing has the potential to actually provide the same setup and forget it results as older technologies. After that, you just need to resist the temptation to mess with it all the time. Moving on to selecting an option which allows us to get into the tank for easy maintenance, meaning when I do need to put my hands in the tank, I don't want to wrestle with the light to get it out of the way first. This really comes down to two things, size of the light source and mounting options. First, if the lighting needs for your tank are not super advanced, 
A small compact light source like a LED module means the small form factor light is perpetually out of the way and just isn't a concern. This is true with most of the hanging options as well as the mounting arm options. However, with larger fixtures, the one thing I would rule out on a ULM is leg options. Legs make initial mounting super easy. However, depending on the size, every time you need to get into the tank, you often need to remove the entire heavy light and manage all the cords at the same time. This is even more difficult if you use cord management solutions, which don't have a lot of slack. I'd also note that removing the light from the tank also removes the light source from the tank, which can make seeing in the tank and maintenance just more difficult as well. So in that spirit, if I'm going to use a larger fixture that covers most of the tank on a ULM, I'm going to find a way to suspend it from the ceiling, wall brackets, or even repurpose some of the better tank mounting arms. With the cable suspension kits, getting the light out of the way for maintenance is as simple as just sliding the fixture up the cord and out of the way. Then to get it back down, just a press of a button and slide it back down. Lastly is the longevity of the lights themselves because replacing lights is a pretty undesirable component of maintenance. I think this applies to all components of the light. The most common component to fail on any of these options is probably the T5 and halide bulbs. I certainly wouldn't call these high maintenance because it's something you likely only need to do once a year or even less. A recent BRS TV investigates on T5 bulb light suggest it might be longer than commonly thought. The second most common component to fail on all light sources are the ballasts. Almost all the halides and majority of LED options have external ballasts which are easy to replace. Many use commodity type ballasts which are easy to find and order at reasonable prices. However, most T5 options often have ballasts incorporated into the fixture itself which is nice because there's fewer cords or wires, no large power blocks to hide. But when the ballasts do eventually fail, you will have to disassemble the fixture to replace those ballasts which can be a couple hour project. On that note, the longest lasting T5 ballast will be those fixtures which properly cool the ballast with active cooling. Lastly, in relation to the longevity of the LEDs, heat is the number one enemy of LED lamps themselves, and they will deteriorate with reduced output or even burn out if not properly cooled, meaning both premature failure as well as the need to adjust them over time to compensate for the reduced output. So the best ULM LED options will have robust heat sinks with active cooling systems which actually monitor, report, and adjust fans based on the temperature of the LEDs. Potentially even better would be passively cooled LEDs which use very large heat sinks, probably exceeding 20 pounds, which are capable of dissipating the heat without fans or active cooling. This type of implementation is rare because it's large and fairly expensive. Lastly, in relation to cooling, it's not just the heat sink itself, it's how well the LEDs are attached to the heat sink and their ability to transfer that heat. More or less, if a light has a flimsy heat sink and it's cool to the touch, it's probably likely the connection points are poor. This is one of those hard to identify components, but it's probably safe to assume it's done better with the more advanced options, particularly those that go to the effort to monitor the LED temperature and have active cooling options based on the temperature of the individual LEDs. Okay, so with all that said, what are we going to select for all three ULM tanks? I'm going to start with the LPS tank. With this tank, I don't need a tremendous amount of par. Related to that, LPS tanks are less susceptible to shadowing or shading effects, so I don't need something that emits a perfect blanket of light either. So in that spirit, I'm going to go LED for sure. As to which one, well, I'm simply going to limit my options to those where the manufacturer has produced publicly available data on how to set up and use the lights, or the lights that we've done a full review on here with BRS TV Investigates so we can achieve those plug and play results that I want with a ULM. I really want to use the settings that we decided on today and not touch them unless absolutely necessary. I'm going to start by saying with a low demand tank like this, I think we could have got away with something as small as the AI Prime. I actually really wanted to use a Radeon XR15 with a new diffuser kit, but my unique mounting situation prevented it. The overflow solution we selected prevented us from using the clamp on the RMS mounting arm, and since we have three tanks here, I just don't want a half dozen wires hanging from the ceiling. The reason I wanted to go with the XR15 is because they've done the work with the coral labs and experiments on many corals to provide reefers with a proper spectrum mix called the LPS schedule, very similar to their AB plus spectrum mix for SPS corals. These spectrums will produce actual results and almost certainly won't need to be touched. They also provide the actual PAR numbers they use with this spectrum to produce the best results, which were in the 50 to 75 PAR range, pretty low. 
Combined with the XR15 par results from the BRS TV Investigates episode, which measures a full grid at multiple depths in both the two foot cube and four foot tank, it should be pretty darn easy to get the right par intensity without the need of a par meter and very likely produce the set it and forget it results we're looking for. I would note that the new diffuser kit would have been critical to the selection. I'm pretty sensitive to that disco ball effect that most LEDs, including the Radions, have. The diffuser kit not only eliminates that completely, but also blends the individual spectrums into a much more cohesive and consistent combined spectrum. For my own uses, I would personally consider this an essential accessory that I wouldn't go without. It was disappointing that we couldn't get the bounding arm to work on our particular tank because I would have very much liked to use the XR15, RMS arm, and diffuser combination. Ultimately, I really wanted to use something different than what we've used on many of the other recent tank installs. However, if the shoe fits, I feel like we have to use it and why we're going Kessel A360s on an A-series mount. Kessel has that fixed spectrum range based on Kessel logic, which is a standard peak for corals and a nod to add in other spectrum for visual appeal. Really, it's probably the only light out there right now where the spectrum settings are designed specifically for its purpose of growing corals and doesn't allow you to select poor spectrum options. Not only that, the knob rather than sliders and phone apps doesn't invite constant changes to it. You just set it to what you like and forget it. In terms of power, it's also one of those lights that it's powered appropriately for the area that it covers. You won't see those peak hot spots in the 600s. We also have the BRS TV Investigates full grid of PAR numbers available for all kinds of environments, making it pretty easy to find the PAR range that you're looking for. Randy also has a spotlight with some pretty distinct setup advice for those of you that don't want to calculate it for themselves. We're going to use the Kessel A-Series mounting arm for a nice clean look with no cables. I did have to cut out a piece of the shadow overflow weir so we could use the clamp properly. This means the mounting solution meets our ULM of being easy to get in the tank for general maintenance. The light is so tiny that you wouldn't have to do anything with it to get your hands into the tank. Lastly, in terms of longevity, we've been using them for many, many years on quite a few different projects. And I don't think anyone in the BRS team has had one fail. The LEDs are cooled with a high efficiency heat sink, similar to those used on computer CPUs. Again, I've never had one do it, but if the power supply failed, it is external and easy to replace. Kessel is actually a subsidiary of Daikon Fiber Optics, who has actually developed the patented dense matrix LED array that blends all those spectrums so well and produces the awesome shimmer that Kessels are known for. This is really the only company in the aquatics industry capable of designing and manufacturing the actual LED diodes themselves. So that said, this seems to be the ideal solution for our LPS ULM tank. We're going to use the A-series mounting arm to position the bottom of the light eight inches off the water level, which produces a super even distribution of light even at the top of the tank. Based on the PAR charts we produced and investigates, we're going to tune the intensity to 50%, which will be higher at the top, but in the bottom two thirds of the tank should be in that 75 to 50 PAR range recommended for LPS corals and Ecotex coral labs. Then noting that any position of the spectrum knob contains a proper spectrum piece for corals, tune the spectrum knob to the desired color, which I often personally like around 50%. Put it on an eight hour timer and we're done. If you wanted the cool dimming options, they offer a cool spectral controller that can do that for you. We're going to install an Apex at some point and we'll likely use the VDM ports for that purpose in future weeks. I'm going to save the suspense and share that we're going to do the exact same setup for the softy and polyps tank as well. What's good for one is often good for the other and I think that's the case here. So that's two tanks down. What about the SPS tank? Well, in this tank, we have one significant requirement that differs from the other two. I want a much more diffused, even solution, which coats the tank in a blanket of light, which reduces shadows, coral shading, reducing mortality, and increasing natural growth patterns and health for medium to large SPS colonies. To do that, we're going to use a T5 LED hybrid. There just isn't another solution that hits our other requirements and fits on a two-foot tank, and there's just no way around it. I think T5s are the best option out there for highly diffused even light. Supportive of that, LEDs provide the shimmer that brings the tank to life. So which hybrid option? The Giesman Aurora is the nicest looking option out there, but only controllable via Android devices, which I don't have. The power module will be the highest power option out there and likely the longest lasting option because of the active cooling and optimal design reflectors. The power module is also Wi-Fi capable with iOS, Android, and Windows. I will share the ATI power module is the light that we run on the Clown Harem tank for many years. We've tried various different LED options on it at various points, and in the end, 
everyone here will universally agree the bubble tips always did best under the ATI power modules. So that's what we run on it. And again, I don't think that we'll be trying anything else. It just works awesome. However, that said, we're going to go with the Aquatic Life Retro Hybrid for two reasons. First, it's just so much more cost effective than most options. It's just hard to ignore. And because of that, a much more realistic option at 230 bucks. That's true even if you have to buy an LED module, but obviously more so if you own already commonly available LEDs and you want to add all the benefits of a T5 LED hybrid to your tank. Second, because it allows you to pair the T5s with the LED solution that has the exact features you want and even upgrade at a later date rather than being stuck with pre-installed LEDs. In fact, ultimately my own personal favorite look inside the actual tank is the Kessel Shimmer muted by T5 lighting. So I can grab anything from the warehouse for this project and my choice is the Aquatic Life T5 Retro Hybrid with the Kessel A360 in the center. In addition to the visual appeal of Kessel's dense matrix array of LEDs under a single lens, it also provides amongst the best LED spectrum blending out there, making it ideal for more finicky corals like SPS. I will say because the ballast and bulbs are not actively cooled with larger optimized reflectors, it's possible the fixture's longevity may not be as long as some options and won't have the absolute highest output out there, but I think it's more than adequate for our use. Since T5s are always inherently a larger fixture, we'll hang it from the ceiling with the same standard hanging kits so we can slide it out of the way easily for general maintenance. After reviewing our BRSTV Investigates data, setup will be easy as well. We're going to go with four ATI Blue Plus T5 bulbs, which is the gold standard for coral growth. Set the Kessel 360 to 100% intensity, and then just dial the color to whatever looks good in the tank, which will likely be in the wider end for most reefers. Looking at the PAR charts, I don't think that there's another option that plug and play produces our desired 250 to 350 PAR in as much of the tank as possible, as even as possible, with as few shading and shadows as possible. I'm confident this is going to be the ultra low maintenance, set it and forget it, SPS lighting solution that we're looking for. So it's been a bit since we started cycling the tank and I do have a couple of updates related to the Kato and the Aqua Mesh from Lifeguard. First in relation to the Kato, we made a mistake by turning the powerful H380 on eight hours a day right off the bat. The Kato didn't respond well. Any photosynthetic organism just doesn't respond to dramatic light intensity changes. So we shortened the photo period down to three hours in the beginning here, and that seems to be going much better. Second, on all three sumps, we use that black lifeguard aqua mesh to create fuges. In both our do-it-yourself and somatic sump, it worked really well. I'm particularly happy with how well it worked in the do-it-yourself sump, which just has a glass box and a sheet of the aqua mesh separating the two chambers. Because the network of holes are so large and its large surface area, it seems to stay free flowing and serves its purpose well of separating the two areas as well as likely capturing some micro bubbles. However, in the skim sump, which has a fairly small porthole separating the main chamber we're using for a fuge and the return pump area, it clogs with the Kato and not the best solution for a ULM because it does need to be cleaned. I think we're going to attempt a larger sheet on the other side and see if that's a better solution because there's certainly more surface area, but in any case, we'll share the ultimate solution in the future. In all honesty, I think it would be better on most ELM tanks to select a sump design that actually incorporates the fuge out of the box. So next week we're talking controllers. There's been a lot of talk in the comments and forum about using technology to make tanks lower maintenance, even some debate as to if that's even an accurate approach. This will certainly be a fun episode, but we're asking all of you here on YouTube as well as the Reef to Reef community do you think the controllers allow you to have a lower maintenance tanks? If so, how do they help you? So this week we're giving away a free 24 inch Aquatic Life T5 hybrid light. It's an awesome solution and this week it's for free for someone. So click that link in the lower left or head on over to the site, click specials and deals and then free stuff. And if you like what you're watching, let the team know here with a quick thumbs up and subscribe because we release new reefing videos all week long. See you next Friday with another episode of BRS TV Tank Trials ULM Edition.